Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. It's Ebro in the Morning. It's Rosenberg. Laura Styles not feeling so well, but give it up for our bro Will Packer on the program yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. What's happening? He's, he's got better, a, Laura. We miss you. Yeah, she got a migraine today. She dealing. Yo, listen, this working at home thing, Will, is yeah, is driving people. Is is pushing people to the brink. People didn't know. know. You know those days where you hated getting up, going to work. Now yeah. people are like, man, if I don't get out the house, <laughs> they want to go to work. They want to get out of the house. Listen. Uh, blackballed uh, on Quibi. Uh, I don't know how many people hearing my voice right now know about Quibi, but uh, it's basically a platform where you can get short form content. I think each episode or episodic content is less than ten minutes. Is that right? You got it. You got it. Quick, quick bites. That's what it stands oh, for. Oh, quick, quick bites. Okay, I yep. like it. All right. Yep. So, uh, blackballed uh, is a new series you have on there. Uh, it premieres May eighteenth. Um, and this is about Donald Sterling. Mm. The Clippers fiasco. You remember that? Sure remember do. remember where you were, Rosenberg? Oh, I remember it. I remember very well. I remember it was such a bizarre circumstance. The timing and the mix of emotions between the anger you had for this information you received and also sort of the sympathy I had for these players. And, and yeah. what do they do? And this fan base. So are you a fan, first of all? Is that why you got into to this idea or no? no. I'm a sports fan. I'm a sports fan. And I'm somebody that is is uh, certainly interested in the intersection of sports and race mm. because you can't separate them, right? And you got a lot of you know good old American fans that want to say, "Listen, I want my sports to be my sports, and then I want everything else over here, and never the two shall meet." Oh, well, those are white people you're talking about. Yes, I know those people. Well, you know. <laughs> and the reality is that there is no no separation. It is, of course, there's an intersection. You know what I mean? The most high-profile black men in the world are NBA basketball players. That's right. Period. That's who they are. And so this was such a – you used the word bizarre, man. That is so on point because you had this moment where an owner – and it's not like people don't think like owners are racist. These are white billionaires, you know? So I think there's a perception of who knows what they are, who knows what they're into. But to have somebody publicly come out, and just to refresh everybody, this is the 2014 L.A. Clippers. They were finally on the verge of relevance for the first time. Like, they had been the most irrelevant franchise ever. This is Chris Paul. This is DeAndre Jordan. This is J.J. Reddick. This is Blake Griffin, right? Doc Rivers. And so, Doc Rivers, Well, and also, right? and also Doc Rivers, who just left the championship the Celtics. Celtics to go yes. to the fucking Clippers. And everybody was like, yes. you going to the Clippers? What are you doing? Like, <laughs> there's, a, there's another team in L.A.? That's what people were saying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this is Lakers world. They, Doc came, they, he had that young team, they finally were relevant, and now you had this owner who came out and said something that you could not deny or sweep under the rug. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is that this guy had been this racist dude. He had been taken to federal court. Well, so now, Will, you, you yeah. unpack some of this in Blackballed. I didn't yeah. know any of this. Which yeah. part? I didn't yeah. know that Donald Sterling had a history. Oh, yeah, yeah. Prior to... A lot of people a lot of people like Ebro Roseberg, a lot of people didn't, like, again, you assume these owners, but no, he actually had, like, quantifiable... So like, then, so then why was everybody, why is this a bizarre incident then? Why, Dude. why, if this guy, it's it's kind of like Donald Trump right now. When Donald Trump gets up to the podium as president and does some races, he's been that guy. Because... Yeah. I, well, I'll let you answer, but I, I feel like fans didn't know just because this guy had terrible dealings in his real estate and being a building owner, no one was really thinking about it until this incident sort of opened the door. No question. I mean, and, and you bring up Trump. Like, the reality is that everybody knew that Trump had this shady past before he became president, but you had a lot of rappers that stole in his virtues. Like, I want to be Donald Trump. You know right. what I'm saying? You had black people like, yo, Trump is a baller. Trump is also the same. He's been said that Central Park Five shit. You That's know what right. I'm saying? So the reality is that it wasn't nearly as um, as known mainstream about Donald Sterling as it was with Donald Trump. Um, but behind the scenes, NBA people knew. The other owners knew. You know mm. what I mean? And so, yeah, this was this was literally like a historic time. And it's really about. It's about the players. That's the one thing I would correct you with, E. When you, it's not about Donald Sterling. It's right. really about these players who were put in this impossible situation. And it, it looks at the five days between the time that that take came out 
and the end of their playoff run, right? And, and the five days before they had to play the, the next playoff game because it was crazy. And behind the scenes, it was literally historic where you had an owner, a white billionaire in America who basically was forced out of the NBA and forced to give up his team. And one thing about billionaires, they give up nothing, right? And power sees nothing without demand. And this is the first time we take a look behind the scenes. And I got to give a shout out to the director, Mike Jacobs. He did an amazing job. You know, we pulled together people who were there, who obviously all the players who were in it, Doc and Chris and all of them. Chris is an executive producer on it with me. Um, we also bring in people like Stephen A. and Jamel Hill and Adam Silver, who was behind the scenes trying to figure out how do we get this guy out of here? Like, what do we do? He said blatantly what a lot of them are thinking. He just said. That's he right. just came out and said it. It kind of was like, I mean, now what? You know? Well, the, my favorite part about that time period, too, was the individuals who were trying to defend. And if we go back and look at that time, the amount of people who wanted to defend that he was saying this stuff privately. It was his yeah. private thoughts that were recorded, and they should hold no bearing in public because it's private. And yes. I remember being at that time being like, wait, 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 wait. I get the concept, but this is this guy's thoughts. This is yeah. what he thinks. And he's yeah. been outed. And who gives a fuck? Fuck him. Well, I, I, but I, I don't see it. I see it basically like that. But I understand the conversation about that. Do you want the standard to be set that if someone has a certain belief system, they're not allowed to participate in things? Well, in this case, yes, because we hate him and what he believes. But look at that on the flip side of that coin, and how does that make you feel about it? Well, yeah, I, I, I think I think I think the social construct is such because he's white, and we live in a country where white racism has basically murdered, maimed, raped, and killed for centuries. It's it, it's based on that, right? It's based in something where you've owned black men. You've you know the. the this country has made money off the backs of black people. So well, that and he construct. literally is an owner still making money off exactly. the backs of black people. And then so. you're talking shit while having sex with a black woman. It's right. insane. Right. And, and and so Rosenberg is a little bit different than just like having some, you know, left of center or right of center, you know, controversial thoughts. You are a part of a major American sports league, mm -hmm. right? And so you have Americans, consumers that come that pay you money. Those, that money allows you to then pay these players and give you the powerful position of a quote-unquote owner. And so you do not have just carte blanche. And by the way, this was the case that really determined that because before then, who knows, like you could, a lot of people would have said, well, I mean, you know, he's the owner of the team. He doesn't play. He can have whatever thoughts he wants. This was kind of a turning point. This was a point when we had to look ourselves in the eyes of Americans because a lot of owners said, what you're saying, Rosenberg, they said, it's a slippery slope. Like, are you going to start, like, you know, uh, secretly recording conversations of all the owners and seeing what they say? And if you don't like it, you get them out. Like, how do we go there? You know, but the reality was they did go there. And these players, these players were put in an impossible situation because you had a lot of people going, you're not going to play. Right. There's no way you're going to play for this dude. Right. And this was these cats dreams. This was the first time their team was relevant. They had a real opportunity to go deep into the playoffs. And now everybody, even though they had done nothing wrong, nothing. everybody looked at them. It was their fault. What are you going to do to fix it? Well, and, and in, in uh, Black Ball, which is out May 18th, um, and you can catch it on Quibi, you delve into, or, and you and Mike Jacobs and the people who worked on this, delve into how the players felt. Um, and do you feel like this is... This has to be kind of the first time they were able to really unpack this as people who went for this and went through no, this. It is. Yeah, it is. It's one of those things that made a lot of headlines and, and uh, was talked about a lot and is talked about in, in sports lore and certainly in sports history. But never have we gone in and really looked at what the players' perspectives were, the perspectives of the other power players behind the scenes like an Adam Silver who was months on the job. Yeah, that's, that's the other right. Thing you that's gotta right. Remember. It was it was um, it was Stern. David Stern was the commissioner up until right before this. So Adam Silver was the new guy with this amazing, huge shitstorm dropped right into his lap. And everybody was like, bro, what you going to do? You know, and so it was um, it was a crazy time. And it's the first time, like you said, E, that we've been able to go in and we do unpack it. We do go in and we look at what those days were like. 
at how power works in this country. That's what I was fascinated by. Mm. The intersection of race and sports and how power works in this country. There's so many little things that make it interesting too because I think the the concept of ownership in sports is already an uncomfortable idea. These white men who own these teams and whose players essentially play for them is always there is something inherently and, and, and behind the scenes they say stuff like Oh, look at my African American over here. Look at him. Exactly. Now, here's my question for you. Adam Silver is one of the most thoughtful progressive commissioners in sports. Yep. Do you think that another league, say the NFL, would have handled something in this way or would they have just swept that under the rug? Is this is this unique to how progressive the NBA is that they understood it could not stand? I'll tell you this. I'm glad it was the NBA. I'll be honest with you, because you look at some of the crazy shit that Trump said and the fact that there wasn't this, um, you know, immediate backlash at the highest levels of the NFL against it on behalf of the players and against what the president was saying. Right. You didn't really see that. You saw a lot of like, you know, soft shoes, soft pedaling. Oh, they was, I mean? oh, they was soft shoe and they was stepping in fashion. They didn't want yeah. and, and and the NFL did not want to get into a, a, a situation with Donald Trump because they were the NFL was in transition a few years ago from becoming a nonprofit, right? Their, their nonprofit status had to get removed and they became a corporation. So they were dealing with taxing and some other things. They didn't want to get into it with the well, president. And they're also scared of losing. Trump supporters are such maniacs. You know, the hardcore ones, they were just scared of losing viewership too. So they really yeah. soft shoot it. You're right. Whereas the NBA, I mean, look at it. The NBA, the, the most important player in the NBA basically went on the attack against Trump and LeBron James. Um, so it's a totally different league. It's very different, very different. And I'm glad it was Adam Silver. And, and we look at that. We look at what he was up against because you can't just summarily remove an owner. You, you can't, you know, they actually own this asset, right? Like American law says that you have purchased this, you own it. You can't just take it away. But what he did, if you'll remember, he banned this dude for life, for life. And I'm sure there's some people that listen to you guys that are like, damn, I didn't really know all of this happened. Like, you know, kind of you remember this thing, but you don't really know the details. It was the first time it was unprecedented that you had an owner be banned for life, not for like a couple months. That's what for all life. the other owners wanted. To. We actually we were just talking in the room the other day, Will. Hand. We were talking in the room the other day about the racist lady that owned the Cincinnati Reds. March shot. March yeah. shot back in the oh, day. Yeah. And yep. she was she never got banned by Major League Baseball. I think she had got suspended or fined, and she had said things or whatever in the public, and eventually that's sold right. the team. But even back then, she was a known racist. Correct, correct, and that's what was more typical, like a suspension, you know. So for this new, this new, you know, commissioner of the league to come out and say we're going to ban this person for life, it was an unprecedented move to back the players to back all those players in the NBA, primarily black, and say, we're going to stand on your side. We're not standing for this. And he works for the owners. So you had a lot of that. We talk about that. We look at how, you know, Chris had, like, people like LeBron had had the Clippers back. You know what I mean? This is when LeBron was in Miami. So we looked at how the, the Heat, the other players were publicly supporting the Clippers, but they were still in an impossible situation. And unless the power structure of the NBA backed them, they would have never got this dude out. So... It's, uh, it's just one of those stories that we need to tell, uh, guys. We really do, especially now. You know, this is a time when, you know, look, race in America is never, ever going away. That's now, right. of course, we got the Ahmaud Arbery's. We got the Breonna Taylor's. We got these kind of things that happen. And you have athletes that are speaking up about it. Part of the reason they can do it is because you had these guys who did speak truth to power, and they won. They succeeded in getting this guy out. And so, and they put themselves at risk in doing it. So that's the other thing that I'm fascinated about as a content creator is looking at that, looking at historical events that foretell what we're in now and still remain relevant where we are now today. Uh, this is Will Packer, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's an honor to be able to um, see somebody like yourself come from where you started and thrive and be able to cover uh, content like this too, right? Because that's another thing that I think that... Um, we take for granted nowadays is the fact that we have uh, black folks able to able to tell stories and in, in the way that black folks felt during racist moments in history. 
right, on a mainstream platform. That's uh, unprecedented as well. So salute to you. Blackball, May 18th on Quibi. Uh, download the app, subscribe, and check out Blackball. Will Packer, what, what are you working on coming up, man? What, what, what other hey, movies you, know, you got? I'm, I'm like all of Hollywood. I'm like at the at the start line waiting for the gun to go off, you know what I mean? Because we paused all around. But um, I got... Um, I got. I did that movie, The Photograph, with Issa Rae and Lakeith Stanfield. That's right. That just dropped on demand. And then I've got a, a new movie. I've got movies and TV shows that will be dropping, in theory, in 2021. And a lot of those dates are, you know, kind of TBD. But I got a um, I got a movie called Praise This, which is a gospel choir competition movie. Um, I got a, uh, a, a new TV show called Bigger that's uh, airing on BET+. Plus. Um, I got unscripted shows that are airing on on OWN and on Discovery. I, oh, so you're busy, super busy. busy. Did you did yeah, you have man, any kept... did you have any shows or uh, films that were mid production that you had to shut down? I had a pilot for NBC that Kevin Hart and I are doing wow. that was three days from shooting. So we had not rolled cameras yet. We literally had just done our final run through. That's what you do on a, on a television show, on a half hour TV show. We had just done a final run through. We were like, all right, guys, Tuesday, we're going to go. And we knew that COVID stuff was happening. We were like, all right, we'll get this done real quick right before. Right. We were like, all right, Tuesday, we're coming back to shoot. And that was on a Friday. And uh, I was in LA. I live in Atlanta. I flew home that Friday night at six o'clock. Uh, NBC Universal pulled a plug and all of Hollywood pulled a plug. I got on a plane. I haven't been back to LA since. So. Here we are. Um, have have conversations started about what what filming looks like? How do you social distance and create movies and f like yeah. TV? How, how does that even happen? Have yeah. those conversations you know, started? Uh, they have. They certainly have. Uh, you know, my good buddy Tyler Perry is down in Atlanta, and he's he's got his own you know studio and really compound. So what he's doing is he's bringing his crew in, and he's going to have them all sequester at his lot. And so he's gonna be the first one to shoot. So we'll see how it goes with Tyler. He's gonna, now, Tyler shoots super fast. Nobody can do what Tyler does because he goes so, so fast. So he's gonna basically take all his crews and actors, sequester them for two and a half weeks and shoot as much as he can within that two and a half weeks, then let everybody go home. Everybody comes in, gets a test and then shoots and then go home. Wow. We're gonna all watch and see what happens but people like me who do more traditional shooting, it takes longer. So probably it's going to be a situation where we'll be like a little small army. You come in, get a test in order to be able to come into the shoot. We shoot. You probably will be able to go home, but then you got to get tested again to come back. Like those are the kinds of things like rapid, frequent testing. is. is so, the, so there is a scenario, let's say, where you're working on a movie or a TV show and you say, all right, guys, look. For the next month, we're all go going to be on lockdown together. And then everybody sequesters and stays, finishes the project, yeah. people go home. That's one of the scenarios we're looking at. Exactly. For that, you know, usually on a, on a film crew, you're looking at somewhere between two to 300 people, sometimes a little more, depending on how big it is. But you're talking about sequestering those couple of hundred people for a period of time where they're out of, you know, the public life, right. can't get exposed in theory, minimize the risk. Um, that's one of the things we're looking at. The other thing would be, like I said, rapid testing where potentially you could go home, sleep in your bed at night, but you gotta get tested before you can come back on. So it requires a lot of things. The testing kits aren't as prevalent as they need to be yet. It isn't as fast right now as it needs to be. You know, we're talking about, we need tests that comes back in a matter of hours or minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's we're talking about it because obviously this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is at a complete halt and standstill. A lot of people out of work, a lot of people. So I'm trying to do my part to get people back, but we got to do it in a safe, responsible way, man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go check Blackballed May 18th. It premieres on Quibi. Uh, I got to tell you guys, if you've been enjoying the documentaries, whether it's the, uh, what is it called, The Last Dance with Jordan or any of the other, ESPN's been running 30 for 30s too, right? Uh, yeah, they're Rosenberg. around. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so. They have another one. There's a Bruce Lee one dropping soon too. Woo! But this black ball d digs in. Yeah, Very, go there. It, it goes there. And how many total episodes is it? It's uh, 12. 12 episodes. And each one is about 8 to 10 it's minutes. Short. Like seven to ten minutes, yeah, like seven, eight minutes. It's short, it's quick, it's like, you know, and what it's I mean? very it's well, it's very, yo, the amount of content 
and clarity that gets done in a short period of time just shows you how much fluff goes into some of these things that are longer. You know what I'm saying? Hey. Like, yo, they get to it. It's thorough. Yo, salute to you, Will Packer. Thank you for your time, man. Hey, appreciate you, Rosenberg. Always love. Thank appreciate you. Thank you, bro. All right, take care, brother.